Good. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Stephen Grunman. I'm the Director of Integrative Studies in our Doctorate in Clinical Psychology program here at Divine Mercy University. I'll be your MC this evening. The Newman Lecture Series, now in its 24th year, is sponsored by Divine Mercy University and aims at building a body of learned discussion that is Catholic both in its breadth of research and in its dialogue with contemporary Catholic Christian thought. We are pleased to offer tonight's lecture both on campus and online. And so just a few words to our audiences about submitting questions for our speaker following the lecture. If you're joining us online, as questions occur to you, please type them in the chat box or the question and answer box in Zoom. For technical reasons, online questions will be accepted only until the end of the talk. If you're joining us here on campus, we have two microphones, one in each of the outer aisles. You can queue up behind those uh, and uh, ask your questions in person. Thank you. And now I invite our president, Father Charles Sikorsky, to open us in prayer and to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, Father Charles. Thank you, Dr. Grunman. And before I start the prayer, a little commercial about DMU. I know we, most of you here are students. We have 80 or 90 here present, but we have another 500 or on live stream. Uh, just a little bit about who we are and what our mission is. Um, we face a mental health crisis in our world today. The past three years, the rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide have tripled. Uh, great sense of the loss of identity purpose is rampant. And the epidemic is kind of a perfect storm. It has tremendous uh, tragic points on both the physical and spiritual levels. We see it in the breakdown of the family. We see it in the weakening of institutions and even attempts to <coughs> redefine reality, redefine the human person. Secondly, modern science and the mental health professions are to a large part dominated by a relativistic uh, and secular worldview that at times exacerbates some of these problems we believe. Nonetheless, close to 70% of those who seek mental health treatment say their values and their faith are important to them in their treatment. And a growing body of research demonstrates how effective integrating faith and virtue into therapy is. And so Divine Mercy University is doing something about it. Our mission is to blend the best of science with a view of the human person shaped by the wisdom of the church. We do it in two ways. We are forming an army of elite Catholic mental health professionals, many of them in the room today, a future, right? They're here, uh, who will serve all over the country and, and even all over the world. We currently have over 600 uh, students and 700 alumni. Uh, we've also become thought leaders, by we have published a textbook that sets forth the truth about the human person. Um, and we have a copy over here, but it's not here. That's okay, don't worry. Um, and we have partnerships for research and faculty formation with 16 different universities around the world. So our goal is we want to put alumni in every city, every diocese, every, every parish, if we could, every Catholic school. And so uh, if you want to learn more about our mission, you can check us out, divinemercy.edu on the, on the web. So I'll begin... Now with our prayer, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> Merciful Father, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you revealed your love and poured it out upon us. As we celebrate the joy of Easter and his triumph over evil, suffering, and death itself, fill us with peace and hope in the midst of the challenges of today's world and our own personal crosses. St. John Paul II reminded us, Jesus Christ is the answer to the question posed by every human life. The love of Christ compels us to share that good news with everyone. We believe that the death and resurrection of Christ reveal the true meaning of human existence. Therefore, nothing genuinely human fails to find an echo in our hearts. Christ died for all, so we must be at the service of all. So Father, grant us the courage to be faithful and persevering witnesses as we serve our brothers and sisters, especially those suffering with emotional and mental health difficulties. 
As, as 2 Timothy reminds us, the Spirit of God has given us no cowardly spirit. Therefore, never be ashamed of your testimony to our Lord. Eternal Father, by the passion and resurrection of your Son, have mercy on us and upon the whole world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, now the privilege, the honor, and first I want to thank uh, George Weigel for being with us tonight. We're looking very forward to his, his talk. Um, he currently, he's the Distinguished Senior Fellow and William E. Simon Chair in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in Washington, D.C. Um, a Catholic theologian and one of America's leading public intellectuals. He actually led the uh, Ethics and Public Policy Center from 1989 to 1996. He's best known for his widely translated, internationally acclaimed two-volume biography of Pope St. John Paul II. And the New York Times bestseller is Witness to Hope back in 1999. He's written more than 30 other books, many of which have been translated into other languages. The most recent book, which some of you have here, To Sanctify the World, The Vital Legacy of Vatican II, will be the subject of his talk tonight. But he has many essays, op-ed columns, and reviews appear regularly in major journals and newspapers across the United States. He has a weekly column called The Catholic Difference that's syndicated to over 80 newspapers and magazines in seven countries. He received his BA in, from, from St. Mary's Seminary and University of Baltimore and an MA from University of St. Michael, University of St. Michael's College in Toronto. The recipient of 19 honorary doctorates in fields including divinity, philosophy, law, and social science, and has been awarded the Papal Cross Pro Ecclesia et Pontifice, Poland's Gloria Arts Gold Medal, and Lithuania's Diplomacy Star. I mentioned his talk tonight um, will be on the vital legacy of Vatican II, and I, uh, when I was seminary in the early 2000s, I, I, uh, we studied theology, it was more about how do you interpret Vatican II, right? There was the one side saying, well, it's the spirit of Vatican II versus the letter and what did it actually say? And people like, we studied people like John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger at the time who gave meaning to it. Um, and I'm sure we, we were supposed to study why the council was called in the first place, and we did. But the focus was so much on how to interpret it that I forgot a lot of that. And so when I first read this book, I was like fascinated right, by the depth of, of what led up to that and why it's so important. I think today, more and more, people, some people have questions about this, and I think it's good for us all to understand better uh, the council and what it said and how it can help us in, in, in today's challenges, in today's world, today's the context of, of what, everything we do here at DMU and everything each one of you are going to be doing. So, you can come here to me hear my speech. So, without further ado, Mr. George Weigel. Thank you very much, Father. Good evening, uh, everyone. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here see all this wonderful work uh, going on here and to see some old friends uh, whom I've known since the days of the Institute for the Psychological Sciences. Uh, as Father Sikorsky mentioned, there is really nothing uh, more urgent from a pastoral point of view than dealing with the mental health crisis that is obvious throughout the Western world. And to do that um, in a Catholic perspective uh, addresses that crisis at its roots, which brings us to the topic of tonight's lecture, uh, which is really in three parts. What, why was Vatican II necessary? Uh, what did it actually teach? And how was it given its authoritative interpretation by John Paul II and Benedict XVI? But let's begin by rolling back the videotape uh, to October 11th, 1962, uh, when an extraordinary pageant played out in Rome as 2,500 Catholic bishops, all dressed in white copes and mitres, processed out of the Apostolic Palace through St. Peter's Square into the Basilica, which had been turned into a huge auditorium, 
called an aula. There were 20 tiers of bleachers, we would call them in the American sports stadium terms, on either side of St. Peter's, from the narthex to the baldacchino of, of Bernini over the tomb of St. Peter's. And uh, at the end of that enormous procession came uh, Pope John XXIII, carried on the Sadia Gestatoria, this portable throne. They had the ostrich feathers on the side, Swiss guards with halberds, all of this stuff. In, in an era of great technicolor biblical movies, right? You know, the Ten Commandments, Ben-Hur, all of this business. This was fantastic visuals. It would, And it was, we now can see, the last great pageant of the Catholicism that had been formed in the Counter-Reformation, largely by the influence of the Council of Trent in the 16th century in response to the various Protestant reformations uh, of, that, of that century. But that did not seem to be what Vatican II was going to be about uh, at the time. We, it was not clear at that moment that we were at a hinge point in, in the history of the church. That drama would unfold over the next four years. I do find today that young people in particular, including some of our most uh, vibrant, pious, intellectually engaged young Catholics, uh, constantly ask me, why was all of that necessary? That's not a bad question. Councils have generally been a mess in the history of the church. Here is St. Gregory of Nazianzus, doctor of the church, one of the three great Cappadocian fathers, explaining why he was not going to go to a meeting of bishops in 382 AD that was aimed at sorting out the work of the First Council of Constantinople. St. Gregory wrote, to tell the truth, I am convinced that every assembly of bishops is to be avoided. <laughs> For I have never experienced a happy ending to any such council, not even the abolition of abuses, but only ambition or wrangling about what was taking place. Thank God there have only been 21 of these things in 2,000 years of Christian history. However, in order to grasp the true meaning of Vatican II, we have to get straight why John XXIII, elected as a transitional pope in 1958, at a moment when the Catholic Church looked from the outside to be a kind of impregnable fortress, took the decision within four months of his election, three months of his election, to summon the 21st Ecumenical Council in, in the history of, of the church. And actually, the reason why Vatican II was necessary, which John XXIII grasped in a singular way, had been given almost 90 years before the council by the saint in whose honor this lecture series is named. It was October 2nd, 1873, and a new English seminary was being uh, opened uh, in Alton outside of Birmingham, St. Bernard's Seminary. It's a great moment of satisfaction for men and women who had living memories of the anti-Catholic penal laws in England. And Newman, who was, of course, the all-star theologian of the English church, uh, was invited to preach the homily at the dedication mass of this new seminary. And you might have expected uh, that they might have expected at the time that he would give this rousing, hey, we're back uh, homily. 
at the opening of a new seminary, which seemed to promise a very bright future for the church in England. That is not what Newman did. Here is what he said on that occasion. I know that all times are perilous, and that in every time serious and anxious minds alive to the honor of God and the needs of man are apt to consider no times so perilous as their own. Still, I think that the trials which lay before us are such as would appall and make dizzy even such courageous hearts as St. Athanasius, St. Gregory the Great, or St. Gregory the Seventh. And they would confess that dark as the prospect of their own day was to them, ours has a darkness different in kind from any that has been before it. For Christianity has never yet had experience of a world simply irreligious. Now, note that John Henry Newman did not say the world become pagan. Christianity had, in that point, 1,800 years of experience dealing with paganism. This was something different. Pagan religiosity, however bizarre, weird, cruel, it may have seemed, it seems to us, in the retrospect of time, pagan religiosity at least acknowledged that this reality of ours was englobed within a larger transcendent reality. This was not all there is. The answer to Peggy Lee's song, is that all there is, was, was no. Even pagan religiosity figured that out. This was something quite different. This was a world that some 30 years after Newman's sermon at the Olton Seminary, the one of the founding fathers of the discipline of sociology, Max Weber, would call a disenchanted world. A world that had lost the capacity to imagine that this reality was englobed within a larger transcendent reality that, in fact, gave this world meaning. Evelyn Waugh, the great uh, English Catholic novelist, caught the character of this disenchanted world very well in a statement he put into the mouth of his hero, Charles Ryder, in the novel Brideshead Revisited. And at one point in that novel, Ryder had this to say, which I think perfectly captures the state of affairs, the disenchanted state of affairs in uh, upper class uh, England of the 1920s. Here's what he said. I had no religion. The view implicit in my education was that the basic narrative of Christianity had long been exposed as a myth, and opinion was now divided as to whether its ethical teaching was of present value, a division in which the main weight went against it. Religion was a hobby which some people professed and others did not. At the best, it was slightly ornamental. At the worst, it was the province of complexes and inhibitions, catchwords of the decade, and of the intolerance, hypocrisy, and sheer stupidity attributed it to it for centuries. No one had ever suggested to me that these quaint observances expressed a coherent philosophical system and intransigent historical claims nor had they done would I have been much interested. That's a disenchanted world. That's not a pagan world. That's an irreligious world. That kind of a world is a claustrophobic world. It's like a house without windows or doors or skylights. It's dark. 
it's silent. And what happens to people in those circumstances? Here we are right in the wheelhouse of Divine Mercy University. People turn against each other because they're frightened or because they believe incredibly weird and stupid things. Um, and that claustrophobic world of European high culture had indeed led to a civilizational crisis. It is very striking from the retrospective now almost a century and a quarter to look at books, articles, magazines, uh, et cetera, from the turn of the 19th century into the 20th century. Things published in 1899, 1900. There is this remarkable optimism about the future. A maturing humanity tutored by science, having rid itself of mythologies like religious conviction, would rise to ever greater heights of prosperity, knowledge, freedom, human fraternity, et cetera. That was the mood in the high culture of Western civilization at the turn into the 20th century. And then what happened? Two world wars, three totalitarian systems, oceans of blood, mountains of corpses, the greatest persecution of the church in history, the Holocaust of European Jewelry, the uh, Ukrainian Holodomor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's only in the first 50 years. That was the civilizational crisis that the church had to address and had to find a way to address that was different than its proposal, which had manifestly not been heard by that uh, civilization in crisis from probably the mid 19th century on. John XXIII grasped that reality uh, in a way that reflected his distinctive biography. Unlike his immediate papal predecessors, he was not the son of Italian aristocrats or well-established Italian Catholic professionals. He was the son of dirt poor subsistence farmers in a little village called Sato il Monte near the town of Bergamo in, in northern Italy. He had been an army chaplain, an Italian army chaplain in the First World War, so he knew that horror show, that first European attempt to commit civilizational suicide, uh, up close and personal. He entered the diplomatic service of the Vatican after uh, that military service, and his postings as a Vatican representative were on the peripheries of Europe, the non-Catholic peripheries of Europe, the Balkans, Greece, and Turkey. He was a rescuer of Jews during the Second World War. He was by necessity involved with the majority Orthodox population of the areas in which he was the papal representative. And he was processing all that, if you'll permit me the term, through a different kind of education. Most of his papal predecessors had been trained in either theology or canon law or both. He had been trained as a historian. And his particular interest as a historian was the reforming papacy, uh, reforming episcopate of St. Charles Borromeo in Milan in the decades after the Council of Trent. After the Second World War, he's appointed the Vatican Nuncio to France, and what does he find there? There seems to be a kind of Catholic crust, but beneath it is a church which has had, in fact, a not very glorious Second World War with far too many Catholic leaders and people uh, aligning themselves with the collaborationist Vichy regime. 
uh, he found a church that was in, that was in a 150 year long civil war between monarchists and small R French Republicans. The monarchists wanting to refight the French Revolution and the small R Republicans saying that's done. Let's get on with the future here. And a church paralyzed publicly because of that. A church that was lo using losing huge number of congregants in the working classes to communist trade unions and among intellectuals to the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. Then at the end of that period of his life, he is given the Vatican equivalent of the gold watch after 50 years of service to the company and made the patriarch of Venice and a cardinal. And what does he find in Venice? Well, Venice looks very Catholic, but there's no energy. There is no evangelical energy. The church has lost its edge as a culture forming reality in Italian life. So when he comes to the papacy, in October 1958, as a 76-year-old man expected to keep the seat warm for a few years, and then the church will make the generational jump after that, he knows that what was um, being said of the church at the time was not really true. Here, for example, is the influential German magazine Der Spiegel stating what I think was the widespread view of the Catholic situation in the early 1960s. Their Spiegel wrote in an editorial, currently the Roman Catholic Church, after a 2,000 year long history, has achieved a unity and consistency in teaching and structure never seen before. Today, it presents an unprecedented example of a spiritual community it possesses a single truth and a single custodian of that truth. Because of that unity of truth and authority, Catholicism is superior to its only opponent today with similar mass impact, world communism. Well, that's what it might have looked like from the outside. but And it may have seemed that way here in the U.S., where we were still in the institution-building phase of our Catholic life. But John the 23rd, from that very distinctive experience, going back over the 50 years of his adult life, knew that that was not the case and that something different was required, something that would revitalize the church as a church of evangelization and mission. Interestingly enough, someone else who had that idea was a very young 40-year-old auxiliary bishop of Krakow named Karol Wojtyla. John XXIII announced his intention to summon the Second Vatican Council on January 25th, 1959 at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls, which I'm sure many of you have visited. There's great shock. Then the bureaucracy gets into the game, and what was called the ANTE, A-N-T-E, Preparatory Commission for the Second Vatican Council, was formed. What that means is that it was, a, it was the preparatory commission for the preparatory commission <laughs> for the council. I mean, it was the preparatory commission before the preparatory commission. So these guys send a letter to all the bishops of the world, and all of the superiors of men's religious congregations, sorry, Sister Marie Patrice, <laughs> um, essentially saying the Pope has had this curious idea that we should bring all you chaps together. What do you want to talk about? What's the agenda? Well, the answers that came in form the first eight volumes of what are dozens of volumes of a series called the Acts and Documents of the Second Vatican Council. 
And to read through those submissions from the bishops is to understand that about 60, 65, maybe even 70 percent of them had that view of, you know, everything is fine. Because what they want to talk about is tweak canon law here, little less dependence on Rome for local Episcopal decision making. Maybe we could celebrate the sacraments or some of the sacraments in the vernacular. It's church housekeeping. That's 70% of these things, of which my favorite came from the then Archbishop of Washington, a gentleman by the name of Patrick J. O'Boyle, who um, had eight items in his letter, seven of which were this kind of housekeeping stuff. And then somebody at Catholic University, who's distinguished provost, is with us tonight, must have said to him, and I think I know who this was, I think it was the then Dean of Theology, um, said to him, look, you're going to look better if you put a big think item in here. <laughs> so after these seven housekeeping, boring, ecclesiastical bric-a-brac things, uh, O'Boyle's last agenda item for Vatican II is the church should, the council should pronounce in light of the doctrines of creation and redemption on the possibility of intelligent life on other planets. <laughs> so I'm reading this in a Vatican archive in the mid-90s. Mid I just burst out laughing. And the archivist says, what's so funny? I said, well, I've li lived in the town for 20 years. And if I was its archbishop, uh, the first thing I would want to know about is the possibility of intelligent life in my own diocese <laughs> before I started fretting about intelligent life on other planets, which is even funnier in Latin, because all of this stuff was, of course, done in Latin in those days. Anyway, in the midst of all that comes a very different kind of letter from this young auxiliary bishop of Krakow, whom I'm sure no one had thought of in Rome for a nanosecond since his appointment uh, was signed by Pius XII on July 4th, interesting coincidence, 1958. And Carol Wojtyla does not send a, la a laundry list of stuff. He sends a kind of philosophical essay attempting to get at the question, what happened? Here is this century which began with, with all of these great hopes for the human future, and it's turned into a train wreck. What happened? I mean, a train wreck he knew personally from his five years under the Nazi occupation and the communist business and all the rest of it. What happened? And then he offered an answer. What happened was that the great project of Western humanism had gone off the rails over the previous 300 years. And therefore, the council's first job was to address the question, who are we? What is the human person? Who is the human person? Origin, nature, destiny, community. And then he offered the answer. The council has to lift up the person of Jesus Christ as he who reveals the truth about us. The truth about us. John the 23rd may or may not, probably did not, read that letter from this obscure Polish auxiliary bishop. But in his opening address to the Second Vatican Council on October 11th, 1962, after that procession I described at the beginning, In that opening address, which is known by the Latin title Gadet Mater Ecclesia, Mother Church Rejoices, he took a Wojtyłan approach to what the council should be doing. The first thing he said in Gadet Mater Ecclesia is that we are not here to reinvent the Catholic Church or the faith of the Catholic Church. In fact, the first thing he says is we are here to defend and preserve his phrase, the sacred deposit of our faith. But we have to deploy that sacred deposit of our faith 
in a way that can be grasped by and engaged by the people who are living in this disenchanted world. People who are living in this world become simply irreligious. Therefore, the council should be a, a new experience of Pentecost that would generate a fresh presentation of ancient truths for the sake of mission. It's often said, and quite accurately, that John 23rd wanted Vatican II to be a new experience of Pentecost, a new Pentecost. Well, why would you want that? Well, look at the Acts of the Apostles, which we're reading in daily Mass these days, and we'll continue to read until the celebration of, of Pentecost uh, 50 days after Easter. What happened at Pentecost? There's this profound experience of the Holy Spirit, and then what? They don't sit there and say, gee, that was cool. Can we have some more of that? A few more tongues of fire, please? No, they go out and in mission. They go out and evangelize. Pentecost and evangelization go together, and at the center of that evangelization, John the 23rd insists in Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, has to be the person of Christ. Christ as he who reveals the truth about us, Christ who is the center of both history and the cosmos. Gaudet Mater Ecclesia is a very Pauline Christological text. It attempts to recapture what Paul talks about in the pastoral epistles, and those, particularly those Christological hymns at the beginning of Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians. He it was through whom all things were made, for whom all things exist, in him everything continues in being, et cetera, et cetera. Christ is the center, and he should be at the center of the council. Now, I believe that if you read Vatican II through the prism of John XXIII's opening address, the council comes into clearer focus. It's not unlike what legal scholars called originalism in reading the Constitution. You have to understand what it meant at the time in order to give it an authoritative interpretation. And if you read Vatican II's documents through the prism of Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, a number of things come, in, come into focus. First of all, uh, while there are 16 documents of Vatican II, they are not all of equivalent magisterial weight or heft, if you will. That's actually indicated by their very titles. There are two dogmatic constitutions in the documents of Vatican II, the dogmatic constitution on the church and the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. That is the highest or weightiest form of conciliar teaching. There is a further constitution on the sacred liturgy, and then there is a pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. Then there are decrees, and then there are declarations. If you read that material through the prism of both Gaudet Mater Ecclesia and those two dogmatic constitutions, you begin to see what the council was really about. The dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, I believe, is the fundamental text of Vatican II. You can make an argument for the dogmatic constitution of the church, and it's not a bad argument. But I think the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation addresses this question of the disenchanted world, the irreligious world, head on by boldly and 
very firmly insisting that we do not live in that claustrophobic house. We live in a world with windows, doors, and skylights. God has spoken into that world, which is his creation. All of this we see, they didn't have the Hubble Space Telescope or the Webb Space Telescope in those days, so we know there's a lot of stuff out there. All of that is not an accident. It's a creation. And that impregnates it with a meaning. And God has spoken about the meaning of all of that by entering the history of his creation, first of all, in the person of the Son, the second person of the Trinity, first of all, in the, in the revelation to the people of Israel, and then finally, definitively, in, the, in his self-revelation in the second person of the Trinity. So we are not alone. We are not alone. Secondly, in the dogmatic constitution of the church, the, the other great question thrown up by modernity, how do you form authentic human community? And a question that had been given so many bad answers. The German National Socialist answer, you form a racial community. The communist answer, the proletarian community of the proletariat. Vatican II says, if you want to see what authentic human community looks like, look at the body of Christ. That's why Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, teaches that the church is a sacrament or sign of the unity of the human family. This is what authentic human community looks like. And if you want a template for building authentic human community in the world, here is this, here is the template that has been divinely revealed. If everything else in Vatican II, from the dogmatic constitution from the Constitution on Sacred Liturgy to the Pastoral Constitution on the church in the modern world, the, dec the decrees, the declarations, what do bishops do, what do priests do, what is consecrated life like, what is Catholic education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If those texts are read through Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, De Verbum, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, and Lumen Gentium, the Dogmatic Constitution of the Church, then, then you begin to see the pattern here uh, in a way that uh, cannot be quite seen if you just take these 16 documents one at a time and don't deal with them in their proper order. So then the question becomes, why wasn't that clear in 1965, at the end of the Council on December 8, 1965? Well, excuse me, that, the answer to that has to do with another distinguishing characteristic of the Second Vatican Council. Put aside for a moment the fact that the Council ended and its teaching landed at a moment in modern Western history when the Western world was just about to lose its mind. Okay, late 60s, not exactly the calmest cultural moment in which to receive this, this teaching. Put, put that aside. And, and look at, at the council itself and note that it's, it has a distinction among the 21 uh, ecumenical councils in that it's the only one that doesn't tell you itself, this is what we mean that did not provide a key to its own authentic interpretation. Councils had done that in a variety of ways. You want to know what the Council of Nicaea in 325, the first Council of Nicaea, was about? You encounter it every Sunday. The Nicene Creed is the key 
to the Council of Nicaea. Two great Christological councils of the early fifth century, Ephesus and Chalcedon, told you what they were about through their dogmatic definitions. Mary is Theotokos, mother of God, God-bearer, Chalcedon, two natures and the one person of Christ. Other councils told you what they were about by condemning heresies or heretics, by writing new canons into the church's legal system. Council of Trent did a lot of that and then commissioned a catechism uh, written largely by St. Charles Borromeo. Vatican II did none of that. No creed, no definitions, no condemnations, no canons, no catechisms. So a 20-year free-for-all about what did all of this mean. Now, it is very important to recognize that that argument, what is this all about, began during Vatican II itself. Between Vatican II met during four autumnal months in 62, 63, 64, and 65. So the council would meet in September, October, and end before Christmas in 62, 63, 64, and 65. Between 63 and 64, and certainly by the third period of the council in 64, it was clear that there were two tendencies at Vatican II. They were not the stereotypical liberals versus conservatives. There were two tendencies within the reformist supermajority at the council. One missed the message of Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, and said, we are here to reinvent the Catholic Church. And the other tendency within the reformist camp, a supermajority, led by men like Joseph Ratzinger, was no, we are here to give a fresh presentation of what John XXIII called the sacred deposit of our faith. That fight started while the council was going on, and because the council did not give you the keys, give us its own keys, that fight continued for decades until really 1985. Uh, at that point, John Paul II, who had been a vigorous participant in Vatican II as the Archbishop of Krakow, had uh, decided that it was time to sort this out and summoned a special meeting of the Synod of Bishops on the 20th anniversary of the Council's conclusion to do that. The key figure in that sorting out during that Synod was the prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Joseph Ratzinger. And after five weeks of deliberation in Rome, the Synod of 1985, in its final report, came up with what I like to describe as the thread that binds those 16 council documents, imagine them as 16 pieces of cloth, binds them into a beautiful and coherent tapestry, or quilt, if you're a quilter. And that is, that thread is what the fathers of the Synod of 1985 said about the church, that the church is a communion of disciples in mission, all three nouns of which are equally important. First, discipleship. Go back to John the 23rd. Christ is the center. There is no Christianity without a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where everything begins. But in the Catholic understanding of discipleship, it's not just me and Jesus, as it is in some forms of Protestantism. To be a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be automatically inserted into the body of his friends, which the Synod of 1985 said he is best described as a communio, 
as a communion. It's like the relationship of cells to each other within a living body. And it's very unique. This is a set of relationships like nothing else in our lives. It's not, it feels like a family, but it's not biologically generated. It has a public life, but it's not a political party. It has an economic life, as the fundraisers here know, uh, but it's not a business or a trade union. You can call it a voluntary association, but that is to empty it of all of its supernatural reality. It's a communion. And if we go back to the Pope, who in many respects set the stage for Vatican II, Pius XII, and his image of the church as the mystical body of Christ, we get this sense of cells in a living body. Then the third point, mission. The body does not exist for itself. The body exists in order to offer others the gift it has been given, friendship with the incarnate Son of God. So to be in the body is to be in mission. A communion of disciples in mission. Now, this notion seems to me to have come just in time. Um, as grim as things looked for John Henry Newman in 1873, or as they seemed to look uh, to Wojtyla at the time of his letter to the Anti-Preparatory Commission, things had gotten even more challenging 20 years after the Council when it was clear that there was going to be no more ethnic or national or even familial transmission of the faith. As I've often put it to people here in the U.S., 30 years from now, maybe 20 years from now, maybe even right now, no one is going to be able, no adult is going to be able to answer the question, why are you a Catholic? by saying, well, it's because my grandmother came from County Cork or Krakow or the south of France or Palermo or Guadalajara or Munich. That's over. It's even over in Poland right now, which I have been trying to explain to the Polish bishops without much success for the last 10 years. It, it, being Polish is not going to automatically make you Catholic in 2030 or 2130, 2030. Uh, therefore, we need what John Paul II called the new evangelization, which is summed up in two simple statements. Everyone is a missionary. On the day of your baptism, you were given the Great Commission of Matthew 28. And everywhere is mission territory. Mission territory is not just exotic places, it's like right here. That's an authentic interpretation of Vatican II, it seems to me. And indeed, I think we can look at those two pontificates, 1978 to 2013, as one continuous 35-year arc of giving Vatican II its authentic interpretation by two men of genius who were themselves fathers of the council. One an Episcopal father of the council, the other I came to understand during uh, work on this book, uh, Ratzinger was one of the three most influential theologians at Vatican II, at which time he was like 34 years old. So, uh, so they knew this personally, as well as, as conceptually. Now, final thought. If you look at the history of the councils, particularly the most important ones, it generally takes the church a hundred years to digest an ecumenical council. The notion that the Council of Trent ended in the late 16th century, and everybody snapped a salute, 
and said, okay, that's the way we're going to be Catholics, is a complete historical fiction. It took another hundred years to work that teaching, whether it was uh, Tridentine liturgy or the Tridentine reform of religious life, certainly the Tridentine reform of seminaries, which took a very long time to get in place. It took a hundred years for that to, to happen. So uh, whether you regard this as good news or bad news, we are only three-fifths of the way through the digestion process of Vatican II. But I think there are already signals of where that road is going to end. And that has to do with looking at the living versus dying parts of the world church. The living parts of the world church, where they're there in vibrant dioceses like the Diocese of Arlington, or in living religious communities, or in great families, or in Catholic universities, wherever you are here, and then you look at the fantastic growth of the church in sub-Saharan Africa, you look at the few springs of life coming up from the dry soil of the church in Western Europe. These are all without exception, parts of the world church that have embraced the interpretation of Vatican II given by John Paul II and Benedict XVI. And the dying parts of the world church, Germany being exhibit A, Belgium running a close second, uh, are those that continue to insist that Vatican II was about reinventing Catholicism according to the spirit of the age. It just doesn't work. As some of you who follow my writing know, I've been talking about this for 20 years as Catholic light. Catholic light is of no interest to really anyone except people with a lot of gray in their hair or people who really have not seems not to have been given the gift of supernatural faith. Catholic light works nowhere. And as I have now taken <clears throat> to saying, in a way that runs the risk of my being sued by the Coca-Cola company, um, Catholic light inevitably leads to Catholic zero. <laughs> Excuse me, as Coke light or Diet Coke led to Catholic, led to Coke zero, well, we got you know two percent mass attendance on Sunday in German cities. That's Catholic zero, and it's the product of Catholic life. Whereas these vibrant and living parts of the World Church are those who do things like your textbook and bring this vision of a communion of disciples and mission to the world today. Final, final thought. Um, for those who are disturbed, and many are, by uh, the air turbulence in the church today, uh, I've often said, and this is a good season of the church here to ponder this, there are libraries of books of church history. There is only one divinely inspired book of church history. It's the Acts of the Apostles. How does it end? It ends with a shipwreck. And the shipwreck becomes the occasion to extend the mission where it had not been before. That's not just something that happened to St. Paul and his gang in the Eastern Mediterranean 2,000 years ago. I think that's a permanent metaphor, biblical metaphor, for the church and the world. What, if we can see what seems to be shipwreck as the occasion to extend the mission, then we'll get on doing it, and we'll be happy in doing so. Thank you. So now we'll proceed to the question and answer period. We'll begin with a few questions that were submitted during the lecture uh, from the online um, audience. And then we'll begin taking questions from our attendees here on campus. Here are five questions. You can pick a few and then open the floor as you would like. Mr. Weigel, thank you. 
Uh, Vatican II emphasized the role of the laity in the church. As a psychology student, what is the best way to integrate the experience of faith in an increasingly secular world? Well, that's what this university is about. So I'm going to leave that question to the uh, faculty of Divine Mercy uh, uh, University. Um, some argue that the promise of Vatican II remains unfulfilled. Uh, from your perspective, key areas where the church can further embrace the legacy of the council, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think I've, I've touched on those. Um, it's taken a while for Catholics to get used to the idea that they are missionaries. I mean, this is perhaps the single biggest change of perspective that we need. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, some of you may remember this. During Lent, we got these little Holy Childhood Society cardboard cups. Anybody else remember this? And you would, if you got five dollars in it during Lent, which was a lot of money in those days, uh, you got to name a pagan baby. We actually used that language. You had to name a pagan baby. I have had the privilege of working with a lot of great African bishops at the last three synods, and I'm desperate to ask one of them, are you my pagan baby? <laughs> <laughs> but that was, missions were out there. You know, missions were out there somewhere. And those people who went out there, they were missionaries. Well, that's not what the Second Vatican Council and the new evangelization that it produced uh, ask us to think about. So I think that's the uh, that is the uh, uh, the big hump we need we need to get over here. And the living parts of the world church, uh, as I say, are those that have embraced that. I mean, you look at something like the Focus Missionary Program. This is inconceivable without the Second Vatican Council, and indeed without World Youth Day in in Denver in 1993. Um, Young people in a kind of Catholic Peace Corps giving two or three years of their immediate post-collegiate life to being missionaries. And then going on to grad school or raising families or entering religious life or seminaries or whatever. So we're beginning to get this. Um, we need to think about this at the parish level, I think, a bit more. Um, most dioceses still measure church growth or church decline or whatever the case may be by counting the heads in church on a particular Sunday, usually in October. That's the wrong measure. The measure is how many people come into the church at the Easter vigil, whether baptized or, or uh, full communion, that's the measure. And we need to start, we need to be th thinking parish life through that way, or, you know, through institutions like this, where I'm sure those processes uh, go on. Um, Vatican II aimed to open the church to the modern world. In your view, how successful has the church been in adapting its teachings and practices to engage with contemporary social cultural currents? Well, let me, let me make a friendly challenge to the premise. Vatican II aimed to convert the modern world. Now, you can't convert it without engaging it. So you can't just say, no, 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 and pretend that technological change, political change, economic change hasn't happened. But the question was not to let modernity into the church to change the church. It was to revitalize the church to go out and change a modernity, which had shown itself to have, frankly, suicidal tendencies in, in the civilizational sense. And now, as you all know, here in a very, in a very personal sense. Um, we've not done a particularly good job of that engagement through the media, except now. I think we're beginning to get this. And things like the Word on Fire Institute and, and that. Augustine Institute out in Denver. These are really important uh, efforts to, to seize the opportunities 
presented by um, uh, new technologies, uh, et cetera. Uh, I thought we were doing rather well in challenging uh, the many bad things that have come out of the sexual revolution with John Paul II's theology of the body. Now, we seem to have hit something of a skid in the road on that in uh, recent years, but I think we're going to we'll be back to that in due course. Um, because that is, I think, the most effective uh, response to this dumbing down of the human condition that ever uh, uh, ever has been uh, developed. Um, to see a move away from institutional expressions of faith to a free-flowing postmodern spirituality. How can we bridge this divide? Uh, and proclaim a bruised but beautiful institution to a generation suspicious of incumbent institutional structures? That's a good question, but again, I would reframe it a bit. We're not proclaiming an institution. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ. And through that proclamation, inviting people into his body, which has this institutional form called the Catholic Church. Um, this is another thing that, that Catholics are going to have to get used to. Um, evangelical Protestants, frankly, do this better than we do. Now, they tend to lack the ecclesiological ballast that we have, but they're much more comfortable talking about a personal relationship with the Lord, etc. This is 35 years ago, at least now, I started working with evangelical Protestants on religious freedom issues um, behind the Iron Curtain. And this is my first experience with this chunk of humanity. And I found it fascinating because, you know, if you get 12 Americans who don't know each other into a room, and they start to introduce each other, how do people do that? Well, I'm Joe Smith, and I'm a lawyer. I'm Jane Doe, and I'm a doctor. You know, people in introduce by themselves by what they do. It's not what these guys did. They would say, I'm Joe Smith, and I was born again on such and such a day, manifestly when they were an adult. Or I'm Jane Doe, and I was born again on such and such a day. Well, if this would come around to me, and... I would say, well, I'm George Weigel, and I was born again on April 29th, 1951, when I was 12 days old. <laughs> that would get some interesting conversations going about sacramental regeneration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there was something impressive here. These people thought of their fundamental identity in terms of when they had, as they would put it, met the Lord. And we need to understand that that's, that's what we're inviting people into. I mean, ultimately, we're inviting them into the body of Christ, but we have to do that by inviting them to meet the Lord. That can be done in many ways, um, but I think that's how we need to re rejigger our minds uh, on that. So thank you, live stream people, uh, for those questions. And I think we got time for a few more from the living audience. Hi. Hi, I'm Brenda. Well, kind of the more traditional mindset where we say this wasn't a real council, it wasn't a real ecumenical council. Can you explain what makes an ecumenical council in? Is there any truth in that statement? Why do you worry about it? Well, people are saying that because they're a bit confused. Um, a council that was summoned by a canonized pope, led by a canonized pope, and given its authoritative interpretation by a canonized pope, if that is not authentic, then there is no authenticity in the church. I mean, this is just silliness. Um, the fact that the council did not, as I indicated, make dogmatic definitions does not make it less of a council. 
it, it had a different purpose and a different intention. Uh, but that does not make it any less an authoritarian. When you get the entire body of the world Episcopate together, and they vote by supermajorities that are beyond comprehension. Uh, I, I think the, the, the one, the document Vatican II that got the least positive votes got 70 negative votes out of 2,500. Now, if that is not an authoritative expression of, of Catholic faith, I don't know what is. So um, I, I think that just doesn't make any sense historically or theologically. And I would invite people who have that point of view to read, for example, De Verbum, the Dogmatic Constitution on the on Divine Revelation, and tell me what's wrong with it. It's a robust defense of the reality of divine revelation and its binding authority over time. So, yeah. Oh. Yeah. My question is actually more connected, I think, to say one possibility that comes to my mind is a group that seems to be trying to live this model, it's not just communion liberation. I, I guess um, reading a very compelling autobiography of my friend, G.J. Sani, who was a very closely um, close friend of obviously John Pope back in the 16th, and to live the presence of Christ in the world, in work, in everyone I meet, you know, to see the presence of Christ in the other. Seems like the hallmark of that movement. I guess I was just wondering your thoughts on that, maybe strength, weaknesses, limitations, but it seems to me compelling to think of that as a possible response to this. Yeah, I, they're not the only one. I mean, Opus Dei would say that that was Monsignor Escrivá's teaching, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the um, uh, unfortunately unremarked uh, great events in the uh, pontificate of John Paul II. I think this was 1998. It's in the book, so you can check that. The book meaning my book. Um, but it was Pentecost, and it was a gathering of all of these new Catholic renewal movements and communities in Rome. There were half a million people in, in St. Peter's Square. And the Pope gave a terrific uh, homily in which he talked about this being, in the broadest sense of the term, the charismatic element of the church gathered together as a fruit of the Second Vatican Council. And over time, the charismatic element, as it always had been, say, in consecrated religious life, had to be incorporated into the larger institutional framework of the church, but you don't need to rush that. Time will test these things. And the ways in which these expressions, whether that's uh, communion and liberation, uh, Opus Dei, Focal Arini, Regnum Christi, I mean, go through the list, are incorporated into the normal structures of Catholic life, parish, diocese, school, et cetera. That's happening now. And I think generally in a quite uh, fruitful way. But certainly the notion that um, Monsignor Giussani uh, promoted that Christianity is not a hour and a half a week thing. I mean, that it's, it's your whole life and you have to find ways to express that in all of the aspects of your life is very much a fruit of, of Vatican II. Now, that has always been a truth of Catholic faith. But in the late Counter-Reformation Church, I think that had become attenuated to some degree in, in parts of the church. Um, Catholicism became, as I say, a member of a matter of ethnic habit. Um, uh, this is this is quite different. This is all in Catholicism, and a variety of these renewal movements seem to me to be very uh, helpful in doing that. As are more traditional forms of Catholic associational life: Knights of Columbus, sodalities and parishes. Uh, these Catholic men's conferences that are springing up all over the country that are quite striking. These are all expressions of 
this intuition that it can't be just about Sunday morning or my daily prayers. There has to be some infusing of all of my life, intellectual, spiritual, uh, familial, professional, etc., cetera, uh, with the fact that I have been baptized into a missionary vocation. Yes, sir. Yeah, my question is about the tension that sometimes you find between maybe a pastor and a parish, so on a much smaller level, like the men's conference or a movement within the church, but a pastor in the parish who has um, families or people in their parish who want to live that missionary discipleship, and yet there's like a tension because there's, a, I don't know if it's a fear of, uh, of losing control or a fear of heresy or misguiding people, but sometimes that spirit of, of mission can get squashed in the church. And in my experience and people that I've talked to, it seems that in more conservative traditional churches that seems to happen more often, hmm. whereas in more but traditionally left-leaning churches, there's more of like an openness to that, even though the people that maybe want to have that missionary discipleship would actually lean more on the traditional side. So I don't know if you can speak to like that tension or not, and it's not necessarily directly related to Vatican II, but you know, there's this call for missionary discipleships, and yet sometimes I think pastors are resisting. Well, if that. if your pastor is resisting that, whether he's left, right, center, or whatever, go find a new parish. I mean, that's the simple answer to the question, and there are plenty of them around. Who, who welcome people doing this. Um, you know, a pastor is, is juggling a million balls uh, in the air at once. And, you know, sometimes people can get a little imprudent in trying to push them. But no serious pastor that I know is going to say to people who want to, you know, uh, be uh, real missionary disciples, no, you know, just sit in the pew and pay, pray, and obey. Uh, I, I just, I don't run into that. Um, uh, now, you know, I, I will frankly say bureaucracy, post-conciliar bureaucracy is a big problem in the church. That's not generally a problem with pastors, that's a problem of time card punchers. Um, and that was not an intention of Vatican II, was to further bureaucratize the church. And that is going to have to be addressed over the next 10, 20, 30 years as this missionary discipleship um, uh, model uh, comes more and more uh, to the fore. Um, <laughs> I will not name the diocese or the bishop, but a close friend of mine was uh, installed as the bishop of a Midwestern diocese um, about eight or nine years ago, I guess. And um, uh, about two weeks later, I called him up to see how he was doing. And he said, well, I, you know, I didn't realize that I was being left with this big financial problem. And I said to him, send me the organization chart. I will eliminate 60% of it. <laughs> and nobody will notice. <laughs> because this stuff really doesn't do anything. Uh, another friend of mine became the bishop of a diocese a bit further west. And one of the first things he did was eliminate the diocesan liturgy committee. He said, according to the Second Vatican Council, I'm the chief liturgist in this diocese. If I need help, I'll ask for it, but we're not going to waste time in, in meetings. Um, uh, today's gospel, uh, the, that wonderful, I think probably the, the literary gem in the New Testament, the, the road, the two guys on the road to Emmaus. It's just magnificently constructed. What's the lesson there? The lesson is they're walking in the wrong direction. Okay, and it's only when they meet the risen Lord that they are no longer walking in the wrong direction, which is away from Jerusalem, away from the cross, away from mission, that they run back to Jerusalem and confess Easter faith. Walking together has to be walking somewhere. 
has to be walking somewhere. And that somewhere is missionary discipleship on the road to the new Jerusalem. And the parts of the church that grasp that, which has obviously been true for 2,000 years, uh, are the living parts of the world church today. Uh, I, I mentioned these some of these wonderful African bishops I've been working with for some time now. And one of them said over lunch during this synod of last October, he said, you know, in Africa, we really do not like this image of enlarge your tent. If you are living in a tent, it means you're wandering around and you have no idea where you're going. <laughs> That's good. Why don't you bring that up next week? <laughs> At this thing, okay? Listen, wonderful to see everybody. Thank you, Father, for the invitation. Uh, where am I going to do some books after this, Steve? Or are they... So, so what we'll do is we'll bring the last few books that we have up to this table on your right. Very good. Here, okay. And sign, sign books. Um, I was wondering whether this was the prophet Elijah and this was uh, the priest Melchizedek here. Yeah, so you can you can choose. You can choose. Okay. You know, just a couple of small closing announcements, if I please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you so much, Mr. Weigel. We, we really appreciate you coming in and uh, unpacking uh, your wonderful book. Uh, we do have a few more. I'll invite Father Thomas to bring those to the front now so that we can uh, make those available to you before, before time runs out this evening. Um, it is also my duty to um, draw to your attention our next Newman Lecture, which will take place in three weeks on Tuesday, April 23rd, again at 7 p.m., the title is Current Status and Future Directions in Couples Therapy, Part 1, Main Research Lines and Evidence-Based Models, Challenges and Future Research Lines. It will be presented by Dr. Martino Rodriguez-Gonzalez, a professor and clinician from the University of Navarra in Spain. And this lecture will also be delivered both on campus and online as well. And so... Um, <laughs> Thank you to our online community for coming, and we will have some some book signings. More. May I tell a quick story about the University of Navarra, please, please do. which is in which is in Pamplona, it's a wonderful part of the world. I was giving a lecture there maybe ten or fifteen years ago, and the rector, as we're walking into the aula for the lecture, uh, says to me, just en passant. Um, we had a terrorist bombing here three weeks ago, but we're we're not too worried this time. <laughs> That's my experience in Navarra.